pet policies, including pet deposits, fees, and additional pet rent, along with weight, breed, and number of animals restrictions, are pretty standard for rental properties. Most renters with animals accept these policies as a frustrating but unavoidable aspect of having a pet. Today, we're going to take a closer look at the logical basis for these policies, how they can lead to more homeless and euthanized pets, their impact on the finances of people without pets, the issue of pets as property, and whether the entire pet policy thing is actually discrimination. Hi, it's Emily from Bite Size Vegan, and welcome to another Vegan Nugget. This video is by request and on behalf of companion animal activist Andy Schulgasser, who has commissioned this video to illustrate her main arguments against pet discrimination on rental properties. Finding a decent apartment or home to rent can be a stressful undertaking. If your family happens to include some non-human members, it can become downright impossible. Pet policies and fees are standard in the United States and other countries, though their exact details vary widely by landlord and location. Termed pet discrimination by opponents, a landlord's ability to completely deny, overly charge, punish, or even evict tenants based on whether they have an animal leaves renters with pets in a difficult situation. Today we're going to look at several aspects of the pet discrimination issue, which is more complex than initially meets the eye. Let's start with the basics. If you have a non-human in the family and are looking for a place to rent, you will face one of several outcomes. No pets allowed at all, severely limiting your options of properties to choose from, a limit to the size or weight of your pet, a limit to the breed or species most often seen with pit bulls being banned at even city levels, or a limit to the number of pets allowed. Fee-wise, you'll typically be asked for an initial deposit, usually non-refundable, and monthly pet rent. The last apartment I rented charged a $600 refundable deposit if no damage was incurred, $350 non-refundable pet deposit with $100 additional for each pet, and a $10 to $40 or so pet rent per month per pet and the breed restrictions listed on their website excluded Akitas, Alaskan Malamutes, American Bulldogs, American Pit Bull Terriers, American or Bull Staffordshire Terriers, Bull Terriers, Chinese Sharpays, Dalmatians, Doberman Pinchers, Persa Canarios, Pit Bulls, Rottweilers, Siberian Huskies, Staffordshire Terriers, Chows, German Shepherds, and any mix thereof. So you know, dogs. The reasoning behind pet policy seems logical enough. Landlords need to protect their properties and ensure that any damage can be repaired with the renter's deposit. The assumption behind an additional pet deposit and or pet fee and or pet rent is that animals cause extra wear and tear and are more destructive to property. It seems reasonable, right? Everyone's heard of a cat clawing the carpet or furniture or a puppy peeing on the rug or scratching at the door. However, not all pets are destructive. I'd argue the majority are not, though I don't have any hard statistics as no one that I can find has looked into this systematically. If we assume that pets will cause property destruction 90% of the time, then the policy starts to seem reasonable. And if something caused damage 100% of the time, then extra rent and fees would most definitely be justified, right? Strangely enough, the tenant behavior that is always destructive to property no matter what and devastatingly so, never incurs its own deposits, fees, or rent. It ruins carpets, drapes, wallpaper, ceilings, furniture, appliances, and even adversely impacts neighbors. Some property managers estimated it costs them at least four to five times more to clean, sometimes up to $5,000, often requiring the complete replacement of carpet and overhauling the unit. So what is the source of this destruction? Cigarette smoking. This video interviews several property managers who discuss the cost of turning over a smoker's unit. Smoking always damages properties, with the smell remaining even years afterwards. So if property damage is really the reasoning behind pet fees and policies, then where is the smoker's fees and smoker's rent? In addition, smoke travels through piping and into non-smoking units and through open windows, endangering the health of neighbors. Endangering neighbors is the reason behind the stringent breed restrictions on so many properties, as specific breeds are believed to be more aggressive than others. Though I personally have yet to meet a pit bull that isn't a total softie, and I have yet to hear of a cigarette that doesn't create dangerous secondhand smoke. For a habit that is damaging on a far greater scale than any pet could ever muster, and 100% of the time at that, and dangerous for neighbors, you'd think there'd be a fee or two, right? Now let's consider the wider impact of pet policies. According to the American Humane Association, the most common reason why people relinquish or give away their dogs is because their place of residence does not allow pets. Given that landlords can decide to change their pet policy at any time and stop allowing animals, 
even people in established rentals have to then get rid of their pet or move out. According to the ASPCA, approximately 7.6 million companion animals enter animal shelters in the United States every year, and approximately 2.7 million animals are euthanized. Pet policies not only lead to the tragedy of more homeless and euthanized animals, but they also impact everyone's finances, as animal control in some shelters draw from taxpayer funds. For those of us who consider our animal companions part of our family, the entire concept of pet policies belies a troubling societal belief system, wherein animals are seen as property. Even the terms pet and owner support this mentality. Blogger Philip Rose highlights this issue, asking, why are there no children fees to match the pet fees? Why is there no discrimination against couples with children? And providing his suspected answer that realtors would if they could, but the law treats children as individuals and pets as property. So the rental industry feels they can freely discriminate against and take advantage of pet owners, despite such discrimination being a clear rights violation. The sad truth is that our companion animals don't have rights as family members. In his legal analysis, Man's Best Friend, Property, or Family Member, William C. Root looks through the legal history of companion animals' assigned value when harmed or killed. He cites studies and surveys showing how integrated companion animals are in most families. They have their own space in the house, they're included in the family photo, with 70% of respondents celebrating their pet's birthday each year. This is not just a vegan thing. Most people with pets, just like most people without pets, are not vegan. And while the idea of animal rights for farm animals is extremely difficult for most people to grasp, the idea that their pet is a member of their family is usually unquestioned. This is only touching the surface of this complex issue, made all the more complex by the lack of uniformity of policies. There are efforts to fight this form of housing discrimination. In 2013, Councillor Tim Stevenson of Vancouver, Canada lobbied to make it illegal for landlords to completely ban pets, as it was virtually impossible for renters with animals to find a home. The city of Ontario has already passed such a bill. In the U.S., pet discrimination is alive and well. At least 42 states have breed-specific laws or complete bans on breeds, as an entire breed is held responsible for the actions of humans raising their dogs violently. Given the logical weakness of the destruction argument, the cost to taxpayers and the animals themselves that are euthanized, and the treatment of living beings as property, pet policies are an animal rights area yet to be fully explored. I hope this video helps shed some light and start some action. On the blog post for this video, which is linked up there and down below, I have a list of resources on how to get housing and rentals with no pets allowed if you qualify for an emotional support animal. The blog post also has tips for renters with animals, including legal resources and how to properly file complaints. I'd love to hear what you think about this topic. Have you had trouble finding housing for your animal family members? What experiences have you had with landlords and rental companies? Do you think such policies are fair? Let me know in the comments. And see the links below to get in touch with Andy and help in her efforts to fight pet discrimination. If you liked this video, do give it a thumbs up and share it around to help others needing housing. If you're new here, I'd love to have you as a subscriber. I put out fresh content covering all aspects of veganism every Monday, Wednesday, and some Fridays. To help support Bite Size Vegan's educational efforts, please see the support links below or click the Nugget Army icon or the link in the sidebar. Now go live vegan, screw the pet policies, and I'll see you soon. Vicious Pitbull.